All right. All right. Okay. So, good morning, dear doctors and guest partners. Uh, good morning, Preet and Dr. Brown. Thank you for taking the time to join us for our webinar today on assessing stress response and resiliency with adrenal stress profile. So, it's a little early this morning, but thank you so much for um, joining us with joining us today. So, some reminders before we start. Kindly put your microphone on mute unless you want to share something with the group. Please reserve all questions at the end of the lecture so you may send advanced questions or concerns through the chat box and Preet and I will be monitoring them along with Jane and Mira. So if you wish to have a copy of the presentation after the webinar, please send to us your name and your email address through the chat box so we can get back to you. All right. It is not a secret to anybody that our world today is under a lot of stress and challenges. With this in mind, our webinar this morning is an easy, non-invasive non option that serves as a comprehensive tool to assess the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Genova's Adrenal Stress Profile provides clinicians with insights on the patient's ability to cope with chronic stress using an easy-to-interpret graphic report which can be used for clinical interventions and targeted therapeutic treatments. To talk to us about this test, we have invited a guest speaker from Genova Diagnostics. Our guest speaker earned his undergraduate degree at Kenso State University and his doctorate degree at the School of Naturopathic Medicine at Bastyr University in Seattle, Washington. He is a board certified by the North American Board of Naturopathic Examiners, and he is a member of the Arizona Naturopathic Medical Association and the American College of Sports Medicine. He completed, he completed a CNME accredited residency program in the areas of naturopathic primary care and family medicine at the Holistic Health Clinic in Tacoma, Washington. During his residency, he worked alongside several leaders in the field of naturopathic medicine. In his clinical practice in Arizona, he delivers a blend of naturopathic and functional approaches to help his patients with digestive issues, hormone imbalances, nutritional deficiencies, and sports performance. He is passionate about working with healthcare practitioners from all medical backgrounds and is committed to the common goal of improving clinical outcomes for patients. Dear doctors, it is an honor to present to you Dr. Warren Brown. Thank you, Reg. Thank you for the introduction. I appreciate that. Um, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. We can. Okay. yes. All yes. right, great. Let me know if, uh, if anything changes or if my audio is okay. Um, it's great to be with you all uh, today. Uh, good morning to you all. Uh, as Reg said, I'm uh, Warren Brown, naturopathic physician. I've been with Genova about seven years almost and in private practice for almost 10 years. And I rely pretty heavily on specialty testing to help me make decisions about my patients. So I'm happy to be with you today talking about testing. Here is the outline for the presentation today. We, we will start with a brief review of the adrenal glands and uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the physiology of stress as well. Of course, we'll focus uh, very much so on the adrenal cortex stress profile with the cortisol awakening response. We'll talk about pattern analysis for interpreting the test. And I will also share some interpretation resources. We'll talk about treatment strategies as well. And we'll even talk about a couple of other tests that uh, you might consider in a patient who has HPA axis dysfunction. The basics here about the adrenal glands. Okay, we know they're located directly above the kidney and really there are two main functional parts of the adrenal gland, the cortex and the medulla. Uh, the medulla is where we produce epinephrine and norepinephrine. And the cortex, which is where we'll be focusing today, 
is really evaluating, really useful for evaluating the chronic stress response, uh, particularly cortisol and DHEA. A little bit about the physiology here for the stress response. Uh, the stress response really starts in the brain at the cortical activation centers in the brain. That sends a signal to the hypothalamus, which then sends, sends a signal to the pituitary. And that's where ACTH is released to stimulate the adrenal glands. So in the stress response, we can break it down into the acute stress response, which is really where epinephrine plays a role. That is the fight or flight type of response, as it's often called. It's, uh, it's a sympathetic nervous system response. However, the chronic stress response is where cortisol plays a big role. And we will talk a lot more about that in today's presentation. Let's define stress. There is a perception of stress, which is largely thought to be emotional or psychological. And this could be a response to adversity. It could be a response to stress at work or at home or in society in general. And then there is physiologic stress where uh, this might involve things like trauma, extremes in hot or cold, uh, might, you might see cortisol in, in a, in a uh, physiologic stress response in somebody who's uh, fasting for a long period of time or has a blood sugar crash. Uh, that can create a, a stress response. Extremes in noise, uh, light, vibration, all of these can trigger the stress response. And even things like infection uh, play a role in stimulating the HPA axis, particularly inflammatory cytokines. So that can activate the stress response as well. So these are all things that could play an impact in how much cortisol your patient is producing. Cortisol is not entirely bad. It has a purpose um, and it's really not, I don't think it's bad unless it's chronically high or chronically low. That's where it becomes a problem because cortisol's roles are uh, with blood sugar maintenance um, it, uh, it plays a role in, in suppressing or modulating the immune system to some degree. Uh, it can, has the ability to inhibit inflammation and T-cell proliferation. Um, it is uh, involved in electrolyte balance, so sodium and potassium uh, plays roles in modulating those as well. And it even has effects on the thyroid by inhibiting TSH and inhibiting the conversion of T4 to T3. I have a slide on that towards the end of the presentation, uh, which shows the specifics of that, uh, which um, we'll talk about in a moment. Um, it also inhibits bone and collagen formation. And this is why cortisol is sometimes associated with patients who have trouble maintaining lean mass or patients who are losing bone. Um, cortisol can play a role in inhibiting formation of bone and collagen and therefore, we're, we're more prone to wear and tear when cortisol levels are higher. I also think that one of the main points, uh, which will be obvious as we go through the presentation, is that cortisol has a strong diurnal rhythm. It peaks shortly after we wake up, and it declines pretty rapidly through the morning hours and towards the end of the day. So it's generally highest in the morning and lowest at night. The functional medicine perspective on the adrenal glands is that they are the base of the hormonal pyramid uh, and that imbalances in the adrenal hormones can lead to imbalances in the rest of the hormones. And this is why correcting HPA axis dysfunction is a great place to start with your patients who have hormone issues because if you can achieve better balance with adrenal function, that can set them up for more balance with thyroid hormones, estrogens, and testosterone. So the adrenals are really a good place to start and I think uh, really makes a, a lot of sense in terms of trying to help the patient have balanced hormones overall. 
Uh, you might be wondering why I haven't said the words adrenal fatigue yet, and that's because this is uh, it's an often used term by clinicians and patients, but it's poorly defined and it's somewhat controversial. So a better description is probably HPA axis dysfunction. Uh, if you're seeing low cortisol levels, you could say that's hypocortisolism, and that would technically be correct. Or if you see high cortisol levels, that could be hypercortisolism, and those are valid terms as well. But HPA axis dysfunction seems to be the dominating term. And I took this screenshot just a couple of days ago from PubMed, uh, which is a large database uh, of published medical literature. And um, there were 11,051 search results with the words HPA axis. There were only 18 search results for adrenal fatigue. And um, this is just a, a one that I think is um, maybe obvious to you already, but I like to refer to adrenal dysfunction or adrenal fatigue as HPA axis dysfunction. Oh, just in case you were wondering, adrenal fatigue, uh, there were only yeah, 18 results. I just want to make that clear. So it's, it's really HPA axis dysfunction. It's probably a more technical, uh, technically correct term for it. Here's a look at the uh, pattern. If we were to be able to measure cortisol continuously through the day, it would look like this. Shortly after we wake up, there would be an increase. And then after about 30 minutes, that's when it starts to decrease. And it decreases steadily throughout the day under ideal circumstances. And at nighttime, it's, it's lowest right before we go to bed. There's a, sh a temporary increase right before we wake up. Uh, but this is the pattern through a 24-hour 24 uh, 24 time frame here. The cortisol awakening response is really the first part of that graph that we just looked at. And this is a physiologic response to awakening. And this is the transient increase in cortisol right when we wake up. It's independent from the rhythm through the day, which is interesting. And it is a measure of resiliency. In simple terms, it's a measure of adrenal resiliency or, or resiliency in the adrenal glands because we should be able to pump out cortisol first thing in the morning when we wake up. So it's that transition from sleep to full alertness. And it is, uh, it's actually, uh, this is really what we're looking at here. It's light hitting the back of the retina, that triggering a, uh, a reaction at the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And uh, that stimulates the paraventricular nutrient, uh, nucleus and the adrenal cortex to stimulate cortisol. So uh, it's, it's really, uh, have a, actually have a better graphic here. I was working on this one earlier. So here, here's the most up-to-date version of that slide. So uh, interestingly, um, Fun fact here is that um, people who have visual disturbances or blind people with no perception of light can experience circadian rhythm problems. And that's due to the inability of light to touch the back of the retina and stimulate this response. So uh, this is, this is um, you know, often results in cyclical episodes of poor sleep and daytime dysfunction because unfortunately that group of patients uh, does not get the benefit of light uh, triggering this response. So kind of interesting that um, how important it is to have exposure to bright light in the morning so that you can produce cortisol. It also shuts down melatonin production. So uh, kind of an interesting uh, piece of research I came across recently. The DHEA, dehydroepiandrosterone. Um, this is surprisingly the most abundant circulating steroid hormone in the body. And it has anabolic properties. It's also part of our adrenal cortex stress profile. And uh, it's also an antioxidant. It's neuroprotective. And it provides a nice counterbalance to cortisol's catabolic effects. 
And uh, cortisol, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but cortisol is also neurotoxic and DHEA has the opposite effect in the brain. So it's a precursor for testosterone and estrogen as well. And it has widespread effects, including uh, impacts on immune function, bone density, insulin sensitivity, body composition, and uh, impacts in the central nervous system as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about DHEA uh, later on in the presentation, but first I mentioned that I would uh, tell you some reasons why clinicians order the adrenal cortex trust profile with the cortisol awakening response. And it, uh, it has to do with a number of different conditions. This, these could be uh, fatigue, insomnia, uh, weight gain, especially around the abdomen, uh, depression, chronic pain. These are all reasons why it may be uh, useful to look at the patient's cortisol and DHEA levels. And uh, this is a, a, uh, a screenshot from our support guide uh, listing the conditions that, uh, that where, where this test may be useful. This is what the test looks like, the adrenal cortex stress profile with the cortisol awakening response. Cortisol awakening response is on the left. The uh, four point pattern of cortisol through the day is on the right. And then you have DHEA, and a DHEA uh, cortisol ratio included in the test. And as you can see, we've structured it similarly to that graph we looked at earlier, where we were uh, looking at cortisol levels through the day. You can see it follows kind of the same pattern under ideal circumstances. As Reg mentioned earlier, this is an easy test to do, maybe one of our easiest tests to collect because it's a salivary uh, specimen and it's uh, six uh, specimen. In fact, if you, if you wanna do the uh, adrenal cortex stress profile with the cortisol awakening response. And uh, it's very simple to do, it's easy to collect. The patient can collect this at home and the benefit of looking at these particular hormones in saliva is that they're not bound to anything like uh, binding globulins or albumin. Uh, DHEA may be lightly bound or weakly bound to, to, um, to, to albumin or, or things in the blood. But when we look at it in the saliva like this, it's unbound, it's not bound to anything. And that, that's true for cortisol as well which really gives you a sense of the bioactive levels of these hormones. So the Adrenal Cortex Stress Profile Support Guide provides this nice table that helps to interpret the cortisol awakening response and the individual points of cortisol through the day, uh, some things to think about when they're high or when they're low. Um, generally speaking, uh, when we look at, when we think about high cortisol levels, these are things that we would expect to see when stress levels are high, when there's blood sugar dysregulation, uh, when there's chronic pain. These are kind of the main things that you'll see listed here for high cortisol levels. And then generally when things are low, when cortisol levels are low, we're looking at burnout, uh, long-term chronic stress, HPA axis dysfunction, we could call it, you could call it that as well. But uh, generally, those are things to think about when cortisol is low. However, it's really best to look at the overall pattern in the patient's result. And that's what we're going to do in the next 11 slides is we'll, I'll show you 11 different scenarios and we'll talk about what each scenario means. And that's really a better way to interpret the, uh, the test. So let's start with the cortisol awakening response. And uh, the cortisol awakening response, this is, uh, as we said earlier, it's a measure of resiliency. And uh, under ideal circumstances, we would see the cortisol level increase by about 50% or more from the waking reading to the 30 minute reading. So uh, it's, in this case, we're looking at a, an exact uh, result here of 50% increase from the waking reading to the 30-minute to the reading. 
So this tells us the patient has the ability to, to make, make cortisol first thing in the morning, and that can help with getting that patient started in the morning and, and making them feel like they have enough energy to tackle the day and to, um, to, to, to work their way through the day. So this is a normal cortisol awakening response here. This one is considered a blunted cortisol awakening response. So here we're looking at only a 16% increase from the waking reading to the 30 minute reading. And this is a result where you could see a patient who's, who's struggling with burnout, depression, PTSD, they might be reporting chronic fatigue. Um, number of conditions are associated with this. I'd say one of the more common reasons why I see this, aside from chronic stress over a long period of time, is poor sleep at night. Those folks who, are, who have high cortisol levels at night or who are not sleeping well overnight or not sleeping enough, uh, it's pretty common to see a blunted cortisol awakening response like this. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the next one. This is an elevated cortisol awakening response. Technically, anything over 50 is normal. Um, so this would technically be a normal finding. However, <clears throat> this is quite a big increase. So 127% uh, or more, uh, you were thinking this, is, this may be a little bit too high and generally, how high is too high is not really well defined, but generally speaking, if the third point uh, on the graph here is above 0 0.2, 0 0.2, it may be an indication that the patient is anticipating too much stress of the day or, or that they're, uh, feel, they're waking up and they're, they're anxious about something. So it, it's uh, not entirely a bad thing technically in and of itself but I am a little suspicious that the stress levels might be a little too high in patients where the third reading is above 0 0.2. And I'll explain that uh, more uh, in a couple of slides. We'll touch on that same idea again. This is a negative cortisol awakening response. It's, it's uh, something I've often seen in shift workers, patients who don't have a typical work schedule. They're not they're, they're, they may be working overnight, uh, they, which makes it a lot harder to uh, collect specimen for, for this test. It can be done, but you know, this is not uncommon to see in, in somebody who's got pretty significant adrenal dysfunction, HPA axis dysfunction. But it is uh, not ideal because we wanna see that second point increase rather than decrease. Um, one other note here is it may be helpful to check with the patient and make sure that they followed the collection instructions. And uh, if, they, if they did and you're seeing a result like this, this, this would qualify as a loss of, of resiliency in the adrenal glands. So let's take a look at the four point pattern through the day. This is an ideal result. Generally, we like to see the, uh, the, the results in the middle of that green portion of the reference range there. So this is pretty close to that and would be considered a normal um, four point pattern through the day. Here is uh, what you could call a high slope, meaning the cortisol levels are just too high. I would say all four readings here are too high um, this could be somebody who's carrying a lot of stress. It's, this might be an appropriate response to stress, but if this is the patient's typical day, this would be a problem. And uh, you might see a result like this in somebody who's, uh, who's saying, you know, I work out and I can't, I can't seem to maintain my lean muscle mass, or I'm losing bone, but my estrogen levels are fine. Uh, like a, an osteoporosis patient um, in menopause, you know, estrogen levels might be corrected with hormone therapy, but if the cortisol levels are too high, uh, that could contribute to bone loss. So these are some things to think about when you're seeing that high slope uh, here. I also think it's interesting that the 3 to 5 p.m. reading, the mid-afternoon reading that we're looking at here, actually went up 
instead of continuing the downward trend that we would expect to see. And when you're seeing this, this uh, mid-afternoon reading high, that is a stressful part of the day for most people. I would say most of my patients, this is a stressful part of the day for them. Um, however, if I have seen uh, in, in quite a few patients, if they have a high carbohydrate lunch and uh, maybe it was simple carbohydrates where there was a blood sugar spike followed by a blood sugar crash, you could see elevated cortisol levels secondary to that. So that may be something to think about too, is if there's a um, blood sugar dysregulation and there's a blood sugar crash, cortisol will try to stabilize blood sugar. And um, this, that's maybe something to think about for that mid-afternoon reading, depending on what their lunch was like. Um, workouts can create a temporary increase in cortisol. So that may be something to consider if the patient worked out right before the test. You might see one point elevated, but generally not all four points typically. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, last thing I should mention uh, here is that we're, we're looking at four points of cortisol that are, that are high here. So the, the symptoms, uh, aside from uh, those two I mentioned earlier, and this could be a patient who is complaining about uh, low libido or a patient who is complaining that they're uh, wired and tired or fatigued. And that's a common question I get from clinicians is the patient's cortisol levels were high. Why are they fatigued? Shouldn't, shouldn't they feel stimulated rather than fatigued? And I think early on in the process, you, you might have a patient who's more stimulated, but over time, if the cortisol levels are high, the patient can often start to feel the effects of the fatigue. This, I would say, is late stage adrenal dysfunction or HPA axis dysfunction, and this is also consistent with a loss of resiliency as well. Um, we're looking at low cortisol levels here for the most part. That first one is especially low, but the last three, uh, or the next two, I would say, are, are borderline low. And so this is a result where you could see a patient who's had chronic stress over a long period of time Sometimes this is described as stage three adrenal dysfunction. I think that could be a fair assessment here to say this is the stage where, you know, initially cortisol levels would be high in, in stage one, um, DHEA would be normal. In stage two, cortisol levels could remain high, but DHEA might start to drop. And in stage three, DHEA is low and cortisol is low. So, I, I, I don't think it's really important to classify things into those stages. I know some clinici clinicians do like that, but I think uh, the, the more, most important point here is that the, adrenal, the adrenals are, appear to be losing the ability to, to uh, make cortisol. Um, I also think that um, maybe a, a little pearl I can throw in here is that it may be helpful to to interpret the test result in the context of the patient's day, whether it was a work day or whether it was an off day, um, whether there was a lot of stress on that day or whether it was a normal amount. So that can also help you interpret and make sense of the cortisol readings. Let's look at that four point pattern together with the cortisol awakening response. And in this case, um, we're seeing a flat car uh, the cortisol awakening response is not increasing at the 30 minute reading. And uh, this, is, this can happen in healthy patients. They're called non-responders and about 20 or 25% of patients may not mount a cortisol awakening response. That's okay as long as their four point pattern through the day is normal. However, uh, how you can differentiate a, a, a patient who's a, just a non uh, a non-responder, but healthy is that their four-point pattern of the day will be normal. However, if you see a flatline cortisol awakening response like this, and you're seeing abnormal cortisol results, that is usually ind indicative of a problem. So this is kind of, this is pretty rare to see in my experience, but I need to mention this just because you may come across this at some point. And this is also 
Uh, all of these little graphs I'm showing here are part of our adrenal cortex stress profile guide. This is a, an elevated uh, cortisol awakening response with a high slope. So this would be uh, an indication of some HPA axis dysfunction, I would say fairly early stage because we're technically still seeing a normal car, but the cortisol levels are too high. So it's, it's maybe one of the more common patterns I see in patients who are chronically stressed and they have a strong perception of stress. Uh, they, they have a lot of demands on them from work or family. Um, and we might be looking at an acute stressor in the mid-afternoon reading there, 3 to 5 p.m. Um, back to that point about how high is too high for the cortisol awakening response. Um, here we're seeing that third reading of the day, the 7 to 9 a.m. reading, is 0.29. And I mentioned we like to see that somewhere around 0 0.2, because 0 0.2 would put them in the middle of the green for the 7 to 9 a.m. reading. So if we have a big response after we wake up, but, it, but that cortisol level does not come down enough, that could be a problem. So that's why I say uh, technically the cortisol awakening response, oops, sorry about that. Technically the cortisol awakening response is normal here, uh, but that third reading of the day is not coming down enough, in my opinion. And we want to see that somewhere around 0 0.2. Um, also, as far as why uh, we're seeing some adrenal dysfunction here, look at this nighttime cortisol. It's, it's uh, pretty far from where we would like to see it. It's, it's quite high. So that nighttime cortisol uh, being that high, it's, it's not uncommon to hear that the patient is not sleeping well or having difficulty falling asleep or having difficulty staying asleep. Here is a pretty robust cortisol awakening response with borderline high cortisol levels, I would say. This is a patient who has the right pattern of cortisol through the day, but uh, there, there is this pretty strong cortisol awakening response and I think the most important point in this particular result here is that we wanna bring those cortisol levels down. Um, they, they're, all four of them are too high. And this is another one where even at that, even uh, for the uh, last point of the day here, even at that level, I've seen that cause problems for patients in terms of falling asleep or staying asleep or even getting restful sleep overnight. So even at, even at uh, doesn't look extremely high on the graph, we would like to see that nighttime cortisol lower. And uh, this is a, a patient that might benefit from, uh, from, from something to help lower cortisol levels generally, but especially at night. This is a blunted cortisol awakening response with a low slope. This is something you could see in patients who are well into the burnout phase where they don't have much energy to do anything. Maybe they've had chronic stress over their lifetime or maybe they've had chronic pain over their most of their lifetime and their adrenals are struggling. So we're not seeing much of an increase here and cortisol levels are looking quite low. Let's talk uh, briefly about DHEA before we start talking about treatments. And DHEA, uh, it's, it's more common uh, in my experience, to see low DHEA levels in, in these test results. And it's because I'm usually testing patients where I'm suspecting that they're under stress, they have a lot of stress. So I oft more often see it low, and that could just be part of HPA axis dysfunction. However, DHEA tends to be lower as we age, and uh, low levels of DHEA can impact immunity, cardiovascular health, joint or muscle health, bone health, uh, insomnia. Uh, you, you, might, you might see that as a, as a partial contributor. Um, cognition is a big one. Patients with cognitive issues often have very low DHEA. And uh, of course, it can have a big impact on energy, mood, and libido. 
high DHEA, could be somebody who's supplementing. It could also be somebody with polycystic ovar ovary, uh, ovarian syndrome. So um, because the ovaries can make DHEA as well, they can make some DHEA. Um, adrenal hyperplasia, adrenal tumors, they are possible reasons for very high DHEA. Usually you'll see extremely high cortisol levels as well in those patients. And uh, you always want to pair that with clinical history before working them up further from a conventional medical standpoint. The DHEA cortisol ratio, well, uh, this is probably more common to see low in patients with adrenal dysfunction because when the ratio is low, it's telling us that um, the patient has more cortisol than they have DHEA. So patients are going to be more catabolic, more prone to wear and tear uh, when the ratio is low. And generally, they'll be more anabolic when that ratio is high, although it's not too common to see it high um, unless the patient is supplementing with DHEA. What do we do to treat adrenal dysfunction? And uh, really kind of three main categories here. Uh, lifestyle is incredibly important um, for, for treating HPA axis dysfunction. And that could be things like stress reduction techniques and sleep hygiene. I would say both of those would fit into the lifestyle classification. Diet, because uh, really this is gonna be mainly aimed at eliminating simple carbohydrates and processed foods and eating whole foods that have fiber in them and that are nutrient dense. Those are going to be helpful for adrenal function and overall health, of course. Um, and then of course, dietary supplements, uh, an important part of the plan too, particularly adaptogens, which we'll talk about in a moment, and nutrient support which we'll also talk about in a moment. So kind of three main categories here in terms of treating HPA axis dysfunction. Stress reduction techniques. I just pulled some studies here to back this up, but uh, this may be obvious, but uh, meditation or mindfulness can be very helpful for helping patients uh, cope with stress and manage stress. Biofeedback can be a useful tool for those patients who like to have uh, maybe a more analytical approach to stress reduction. Um, heart rate variability can be measured with uh, watches or with uh, devices that clip to the ear or, or uh, you know, those kinds of things uh, can give the patient feedback as far as uh, is their med meditation getting them to the point where they're actually lowering their heart rate variability and lowering, uh, potentially lowering their cortisol as well. Um, progressive muscle relaxation. Uh, then we have things like Qigong or Tai Chi that are very grounding forms of exercise. Um, yoga can be very grounding for, for some patients. And uh, things like massage therapy and regular exercise can also help. Uh, all of these, I would say, are, are stress reduction techniques and, and uh, would be worth considering in terms of addressing the lifestyle part of the treatment plan. Sleep hygiene is also part of that lifestyle part of the treatment plan because patients will tend to benefit from following a regular sleep schedule. Going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time every day can be helpful for setting the circadian rhythm. We also want to minimize stimulating substances like caffeine or energy drinks uh, we don't want to be exposed to a lot of technology before we go to sleep. We want to uh, put ourselves in a state where we can get some rest and we're not stimulated. I tell my patients not to eat late at night, not only because of cortisol, but also because of gut health. It's important to get the benefit of the migrating motor complex. And if we're eating late at night, uh, we potentially lose out on some of that benefit. So it's important for gut health and adrenal health, I would say. Uh, we want to minimize napping during the day. We want to sleep in a darkened room, ideally, and usually at a cool temperature uh, will help most patients get better quality sleep. Uh, adaptogens for adrenal health. So it's, this is not an all-inclusive list here. There are a lot of uh, botanical medicines that would qualify as an adaptogen, but these are some of my favorites. 
And um, that we have things like ashwagandha, magnolia, rhodiola, uh, bacopa, and eleutherococcus. And these are all things that tend to balance adrenal function. They may even help with low cortisol levels. They're typically used with higher cortisol levels, but they are balancers and uh, can be very helpful as part of the plan. Um, I also noticed on uh, a, a stress and sleep complex on the BioBalance product catalog that would, would meet a lot of those, uh, would, would contain a few of those ingredients. So that was, uh, that's it, that, that may be something to consider. Uh, licorice root is technically an adrenal adaptogen and uh, this can be used to help correct low cortisol levels because it extends the half-life of cortisol. So um, that is, a, is one of my favorites for patients with low cortisol levels is licorice root tea. Uh, that, can, that can help to increase their, their cortisol levels. So it could be worth considering. Uh, however, in patients with blood pressure issues, be careful because it can increase blood pressure in some patients. Uh, that's licorice root. Okay, uh, nutrient therapies for adrenal health. Uh, these would be things like phosphatidylserine or L-theanine. Uh, these can help to lower cortisol levels. They are, uh, one of my favorites is phosphatidylserine right before bed in a patient who has a high cortisol level because that can help to lower the cortisol. L-theanine, I like to use that one during the day to help lower, lower cortisol because it can, uh, can have the same effect. In some patients, it helps them feel a little bit more alert. So I, I think that's a, a good, uh, a worthy consideration, but I tend to use L-theanine earlier in the day and phosphatidylserine later in the day, ideally before bed. Then we have things like magnesium glycinate, uh, helpful for sleep support, for relaxation, and for overall health, I would say. Uh, vitamin C and B vitamins are important uh, from a nutrient perspective for adrenal health and overall health. DHEA, uh, easy to consider this one when you're seeing low DHEA levels. However, in a young patient, I always think of that as a temporary solution, uh, a young adult patient that is, a uh, temporary solution because uh, if we give them a bunch of DHEA, it could potentially suppress their own production of DHEA, so it can be counterproductive. In elderly patients, uh, they may need DHEA in the long term, depending on their stress levels throughout their life and their overall health and adrenal health. So DHEA may be a temporary solution for some patients. For older patients, it may be more of a long-term strategy. Adrenal gland extracts. These, I think about when I'm trying to increase cortisol levels, so if, uh, if you have a bovine-derived uh, adrenal gland, sometimes they're derived from sheep or pig, but it's basically desiccated adrenal gland. And it can be helpful for some patients, but it's something I only think about when cortisol levels are low. And also I think about that as a temporary solution because ultimately we want to get them, get them to the point where they're not dependent upon those things. Uh, I've included this slide. Actually, there are two slides talking about behavior change here because patients tend to make the most progress when the lifestyle aspect of the treatment plan is in place. And because of this, it can be helpful to identify where that patient is in the change process. And I would say this is true for anything that we recommend to our patients where there's a lifestyle part of the plan because they have to do the lifestyle part of the plan. And some patients, uh, if they're in that pre-contemplation stage, they're not, e they're not even aware that what they're, what they're doing or, or that they need to change. So th that requires some education, I find. Um, contemplation phase patients, those are patients who are thinking about changing, but they're weighing the pros and cons generally. The planning phase is a patient who's already bought in and says, I, I know I need to make a change. Uh, what, what are the steps that we need to do in order to make that happen? And of course, we've had to have the action, maintenance, and, and, and hopefully not relapse, but uh, 
these are kind of the stages of change. And I always try to identify where my patient is on this progression. I think it can be really helpful, uh, especially when you're treating patients uh, with lifestyle medicine or lifestyle interventions. Um, treatment considerations here. So restoring HPA axis function often takes somewhere between three and 12 months for, for some patients. So setting expectations can be helpful. Um, they're typically not going to feel better overnight. It, it's going to take some time to, to fix the adrenal glands, but it's definitely worth doing. So I always try to frame it um, as uh, you know, this might take a couple of months before you really start to feel a difference, but it's, it's going to be worth it and it's, it's going to be worth making some changes. Um, this is something that I think is important to keep in mind because some patients expect an overnight fix and when fixing HPA axis dysfunction, it often takes longer than that. Um, as adrenal function improves, there may be a need to adjust other hormone therapies. So a thyroid, estrogens, testosterone, if the patient's taking any of those, those may need to be adjusted as adrenal function improves because adrenal function can impact those things. And of course, patient compliance and adherence is important. So it's important they follow the plan and that they're compliant with. And I think part of that, uh, keeping in mind where they are in the change process, I think can, can be helpful for uh, identifying if they're if they're having trouble with that. I mentioned earlier that I talk about the impact of the adrenals and the thyroid and how they interact. And this is one of the best slides I've ever seen for that. And this picture was taken from a, from a, a website here that was referenced at the bottom right there. But uh, oh, on the left, you have the HPA axis. On the right, you have the HPT axis. Hypothalam hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. And you can see at the top of the slide, there's a stress response. That stress response triggers the HPA axis to, uh, it triggers the hypothalamus actually to, uh, to communicate with the pituitary and ultimately the adrenals. And in that process, corticotropin releasing hormone is produced and cortisol itself is produced. Both of those you can see can impact uh, or inhibit, more specifically inhibit TSH and the conversion of T4 to T3. So this is how high cortisol levels, chronically elevated cortisol levels could have a negative impact on thyroid. And this could be an explanation for at least one type of hypothyroidism. Maybe not uh, autoimmune types of hypothyroidism, but but maybe uh, a subclinical type of hypothyroidism. So uh, this is that, uh, in, in, that interaction between the adrenals and the thyroid. So some additional testing to consider. First, uh, I would say you know, because gut symptoms are often exacerbated by stress and the stress response can make it more difficult for patients to make digestive secretions, it's not a bad idea to think about stool testing like the GIFX comprehensive. Another option is that uh, is because HPA axis dysfunction can lead to imbalances in estrogens and androgens, something like the complete hormones profile where you can look at androgens and estrogens uh, as part of the test uh, could, could be something to consider. And um, there is some data to support the idea that chronically upregulated stress responses have this association with elevated oxidative stress markers like OHDG. So something like the metabolomics uh, test may be worth considering. Here are some additional resources that I think uh, could be helpful to consider. We have a lot of resources on our website, including the adrenal cortex stress profile support guide. Uh, we have uh, video modules and webinars. There is a podcast called The Lab Report, which is, uh, which is uh, orchestrated by Dr. Patty Devers and Dr. Michael Chapman in our department at Genova, the medical, medical affairs department. Uh, and in, uh, in the US and UK and Canada, we have online consultations or, or um, phone consultations that we 
consult with clinicians uh, about. So there are some quite a few resources there. Uh, I know that was a lot of information here about the adrenals, um, but I'm happy to uh, take a few minutes to answer some questions uh, if you have them. And um, in fact, I can start off with one question uh, myself just to get the conversation going here. Um, earlier on, early on in my career, I had a patient who uh, had sky high cortisol levels, just they were at the top of the chart. And I'll go back to um, a chart just to kind of show you what I mean here. For instance, if we were looking at the, uh, the, the a result like this, the, the data points were all the way at the top of the graph. And we were talking with the patient and they were stressed, but they weren't acutely stressed. Um, there was reason to believe that their cortisol levels would be high, but not as high as I was expecting. These were high all the way across. And after inquiring uh, with the patient, um, I, I was talking with him more about his overall health. It turns out he had a cortisone injection uh, a week before the test. So he had a shoulder injury and uh, got a cortisone injection from his orthopedic doctor to try and, and relieve the pain that he was under. And uh, we ended up seeing cortisol levels extremely high in that patient. So that's maybe a little clinical pearl. If you have a patient who's had a cortisone injection or if they're using cortisone creams um, for, for skin problems, then uh, you might see that cortisol levels are going, are, will, will be high in testing. So I would say if they've had a cortisone injection within a month leading up to the test, you might see some evidence of that in the cortisol readings. And if they're using cortisone cream, it may depend on how much they're using um, and, you know, and uh, may depend on the, the absorption of that as well. So it's a little bit harder to figure out for cortisone creams, but cortisone injections, you will often see a very high, uh, high levels for cortisol. And I would say if it's possible, probably might be a good idea to wait about a month before you test that particular patient. So that was, uh, uh, I'm sort of asking myself the first question, but I, I just wanted to mention that because I, I didn't have a slide that directly addressed that, but it is something you may run into from time to time, depending on the types of patients that you see. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. And I would like to share that we are also offering a special pricing of the Adrenal Cortex Express Stress Profile exclusive to our doctors who, jo who joined us in this webinar. So this can be availed by your patients until July 20, 2021. So now we would like to open the floor for any questions. Please feel free to unmute your microphones if you have any questions. Dr. Brown, it's pre. Um, we did get a question in, in the chat, but it seems like there's a couple of parts to it. I don't know if you want to read it. It might be too much for me to read. Um, okay, I'll take a look. Okay. It's from Dr. Flores. Okay, let's see here. All right. I'm scrolling through the comments here. Okay, I'm sorry I missed some of these here. I'll try to I'll try to work our way through these. Okay. Uh, a few questions. Can car and cortisol slope for the day be acceptable to the wake sleep patterns of a particular set of population taking, uh, taking on graveyard shifts like BPO employees or MDs who go on hospital duties? And can adrenal cortex stress profile be applied for them? I will say it's it's hard to test patients on uh, who have a who have a um, an, an abnormal schedule. If they're working overnight, or if they're uh, doing shift work uh, at odd hours, um, chances are they are going to have some kind of adrenal dysfunction. And I think it there's two ways you could test those types of patients. One is that you could have them collect that first specimen at 6 a.m. regardless of what they're doing. Uh, 
you could have them collect uh, at, at the exact times indicated in the in the collection instructions, and you you would know that you're comparing them to a schedule that's really not their schedule. That could be an option, and uh, you just would have to sort of temper your interpretation. Uh, when you get those test results back and you would look for a, cur a curve of some kind. It might look backwards where the lower points are early on and the, the uh, nighttime results are higher, um, but that may be one strategy. Another strategy is you could have the patient alter their collection schedule to include, um, it, you know, if they wake up at 3 p.m. to start getting ready for work, then you have them collect then um, that there's some challenges to interpreting that as well. So uh, it's never easy with shift workers, uh, but I do think it can be helpful because you can at least see the absolute levels of cortisol. However, they would be compared to specific times during the day. Um, so in those patients, if you're seeing very low cortisol levels across the board, that does give you some good information to work with. And likewise, on the other, I mean, on the other hand, uh, if, they're, if you're seeing very high levels, that also I think can give you some information. It's not quite as valuable as comparing them to the ideal times uh, and the ideal ranges for those times, but it can be done. Uh, I would encourage you to write on the requisition form if you were to take that strategy that uh, you inform the patient to collect at an alternate schedule, to not follow the collection instructions. Um, so that way that will let the lab know that you're okay with them collecting at different times. So I kind of a long-winded answer there, I'm sorry for that, but I would say you know, it may be a little harder to interpret in general. Yeah, I'd say maybe even harder for the cortisol awakening response part of the test but the four point pattern through the day, I think you could get some good information from that potentially. So I hope that answered the question. I'm looking through the rest of the chats here. Uh, let's see here. How do we monitor a patient's response to treatment? When to recheck? I would say three months might be the earliest I would recheck a patient. I usually wanna do it at six months or 12 months, um, but I'd say probably you know, if I'm prescribing DHEA, I generally want to check them at three months just to make sure I'm not overdoing it with DHEA. Um, but if I'm just checking, uh, if I'm put, putting them on adrenal adaptogens and telling them to make some diet and lifestyle changes, six months, I think, is a good time to check back in. Uh, let's see here. Another question. What would be a common cause of non-response to treatment? Non-response to treatment, um, I would say often it's a patient who doesn't have the time or the energy to put into the lifestyle part of the plan. That seems to be the biggest issue is, is patients who are under a lot of stress. Sometimes there's not a whole lot about their life that they have control of. So it becomes hard for those patients to make the necessary lifestyle changes in order to get progress. I'd say maybe that, that might be the most common reason why I see patients not responding to treatment. Um, but uh, I would say another possible explanation might be patients who have sleep apnea, um, an undiagnosed sleep apnea or sleep disorder. Um, for that reason, sometimes it does make sense to refer the patient for a sleep study to see, or at least to rule that out. Uh, because if they're not sleeping well overnight and they're not responding to phosphatidylserine or adrenal adaptogens and their sleep is still, they still wake up feeling exhausted, uh, then I would say it may be worthwhile uh, referring them for a sleep study just to evaluate them for sleep apnea. Uh, let's see here, another question here. Uh, well, I see some comments. That was very informative, enlightening. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, okay, we appreciate the response to the questions. Great, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at the comments. I think I've got all of them, but feel free to jump in if you see any that I've missed or if you have others. Oh, oh I have one other, one other question 
that I can sort of ask my ask myself here about the test. Addison's disease or Cushing's disease, what would you expect to see? Those are adrenal pathologies. Uh, what might you expect to see in those tests? Uh, we might as well talk about that here since I didn't have a slide on that, I apologize. Cushing's disease is generally high cortisol levels. It's a pathology where there's a, 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 tumor, a tumor or a hyperplasia. There's uh, patients are generally making very high amounts of cortisol. And you may see the, the four points through the day very high up on the scale. Those patients usually have the buffalo hump on, on the back of their upper, upper, um, upper back there. They have kind of a fatty hump there. They may have purple striae on the abdomen. They may have thin skin. Um, if the patient has those symptoms and you're seeing very high cortisol levels, you might need to rule that out. That's Cushing's disease. Addison's disease is kind of the opposite of that. And you're usually seeing these uh, four points of cortisol all the way at the bottom of the graph. So they're extremely low and they have adrenal failure. So they're not making cortisol typically or not very much of it at least. So that may be something where if you're seeing all four points very low, uh, it may make sense if the clinical history supports it uh, to consider Addison's disease as a, as a possibility. This test is not meant to diagnose those conditions from a conventional medical standpoint. So that, I need to make that clear, but those would be some things that you might see in, in, a patients with Cush, in a patient with Cushing's or a patient with Addison's disease. Uh, I hope that was helpful. Um, any other questions here? Are we, are we okay? Dr. Brown, I don't see anything. Um in the chat, but if anybody has any questions, please reach out to Reg and she's happy to forward them to us where Dr. Brown can answer them if you do come to think of any. All right, thanks, Pete. So if there are no more questions, I'd like to wrap up this session by thanking Dr. Brown for taking time from his extremely busy schedule to be with us today. And of course, to Pete for organizing the event. Now, the adrenal stress profile is available in the Philippines through us, BioBalance. If you need more information about the test, please reach out to us. A special discount of 2,000 pesos will be applied for all your test referrals until July 20, 2021. You may inquire through Mira, Jane, or myself. You may also visit Genova's website at www gdx.net for related webinars and podcasts. Again, thank you so much for your time and we look forward to working with you in restoring health through balanced, personalized, and measured nutrition. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brad. We will see you soon again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Breed. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, guys. Bye.